Welcome everyone uh, to our fourth gathering of the year. My name is John York. I am the faculty director for the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Cal Poly and also a professor in the College of Business. And it's my pleasure to be able to welcome you and tell you a little bit about what we're going to be disenfranchised citizens of the districts in Panem in the popular Hunger Games survival quest. I am going to introduce to you Lorraine Donegan. Lorraine is a professor of graphic communications at Cal Poly and also one of our faculty entrepreneurship fellows. This past year she has been involved to, in a great many ways in bringing entrepreneurship up on the campus and in involving both her department and others as well. The most important thing, I should say the most important, but the most exciting recently was Lorraine organized and sponsored and put on the hackathon. The Design and Development Hackathon, where how many? Over, over 100 students. Over 100 students, only students this time, from all different colleges spent how many hours? 12 hours. 12 hours? Yeah, 12 it was hours. A 12 hour hackathon. Some spent a lot more though, right? Uh, a lot more than they that, yes. Stayed up overnight writing new physics engines and things like that. Um, to prove some kind of application, some kind of idea, and some kind of design. And Lorraine was the both the brains and the energy behind that. And she has also um, helped us put together the panel today. And I'm going to turn it over to her for uh, getting started. Okay. Well, thank, thank you everyone for coming. I, this is an exciting panel for me because uh, I am so ingrained in design, but in many different ways. And I'm really happy to have this panel here to really dispel some myths about design. But I'd like each of the panelists to introduce themselves. You all have the uh, sheet that has the many bios, but I'll have each of the panelists introduce themselves. Javier? Okay, I'm Javier de la Fuente. I'm originally from Argentina, so speaking in English is not my best good. And I am a professor here at the Industrial Technology at Park Poly. Uh, I have been trained as an industrial designer, and I have a master and a PhD in packaging. Uh, my research interests relies on usability of products, including packaging, and especially healthcare products. And I am also a co-founder of Factor IDD. Uh, IDD stands for Innovation Design and Development, which is a, a design consulting firm for product design and packaging. Hi everybody, I'm Marianne Masterson, and um, my background is focused heavily in new product development and brand strategy, integrating um, competitive strategy with user experience, and um, I've worked at Microsoft, I spent a great deal of time in their brand strategy team, working on products like Windows and Xbox and the Xbox New Products Incubator. Um, I also work for Frog Design, where I ran their brand innovation group for several years, um, essentially working in that same vein, helping companies understand and optimize a competitive strategy and think about what that means for their product experience. Um, more recently, I'm a co-founder of a startup incubator in San Francisco called Mix and Stir Studio, which um, is partnered with the California College of the Arts and is focused on design-driven entrepreneurs, so people who are really focused on user-centered design. And um, I also work with companies on brand strategy and experience strategy. So that's my background. Delighted to be here. I'm Jeff Hokett. I'm the UX director at Rock Communications, based in San Francisco. But two of us telecommute from here. I'm one of them. We're spread all over the West and don't really uh, have a physical nucleus. We have an office in San Francisco that no one ever goes to. It's kind of 
uh, we are a UX design studio. We work on apps only, not meaning iPhone apps only, meaning uh, web, desktop, and mobile apps only, not marketing websites or anything like that. Rocket's been around for 22 years, so we're kind of into this. And I've been with them for six. I'm a Cal Poly computer science graduate from 87, and I started off as an engineer interested in design, and now I'm a designer interested in engineering. Kind of morphed over the years. I'm a Cal Poly dad and a Cal Poly son. Hi, my name is Missy Reitner Cameron. I am the founder, the creative director, and the brand muffin of 3i Design. Uh, we are a local print and web design studio uh, based right over there by Railroad Square. Uh, we focus on brand experience, brand strategy, and brand management for clients across the board. We don't, um, we don't manage just one type of vertical, we're kind of all over the place. Uh, my background is I was uh, in Los Angeles, that's where I formerly was trained and was a art director in a youth culture marketing firm. Um, so, and I have a background in music uh, marketing and sales. So there you go. Oh, and I'm not a Cal Poly student, sorry. I have Cal Arts. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. I'll ask the very first question, which is um, based off the theme of this forum tonight. Oh, before I forget, if you have a question, a specific question, feel free to tweet um, your questions to the above address, and Caleb will um, transfer them all over to me. Okay, so. Any one of you can answer this. You don't all have to answer it, but you can. Is design more than graphics? Emphatically, yes. Uh, I, I only do software, so I'll go from a software point of view, but uh, all the time I am sent, say, a series of screenshots that are all beautiful, standing alone, but make no sense as a system. Like, how do you get from here to there? And why is that on the screen? Stuff like that. I just got one yesterday from a colleague that, you know, how do we unwind this? So um, there's a naivete I see all the time. That it's a, a Photoshop job to do um, interface design, and it starts way before that. And I think that's the thing that people are having a lot of trouble understanding. They're like, I just need a logo. Well, that's awesome. What are you going to do with that logo? Are you going to put it on something? Okay. You know, but like, what are you going to put it on? What's the thing that you should put it on? What has? I think it's getting people to get really deep into the conversation instead of just thinking, I just need this one thing. There's no just one thing that allows a company to go. So. Well, I think if you are a graphic designer, your life is around, around graphics, so I think that, that statement would be true. If you are working with physical products, uh, with, with the brand, for example, you have more than, than graphics already because you are dealing with, with the shape, the physical shape. But even you will have to consult somebody to put the logo in the right place. So graphics are really important. So we, I think we have to recognize the importance of graphic design. Why does it cost so much? I mean, my nephew has a Mac. Can I just hire a nephew? Um, you just killed me a little bit. A <laughs> little <laughs> piece of my heart just yeah. Let me tell you how many times I get that um, from. Um, I would say that if you're going to actually go through the design process, there is a, there's a process that we use in our office, and I know different studios have different types of processes they go through, but there is a, there is a, a science to this. This isn't just like, hey, I'm going to make something pretty and hope it flies. It doesn't, I mean, there are things that can work that way, very few of them do. You know, I think about it's a matter of, uh, there's research, there's strategy, there's so much that needs to be done before um, you can even start putting a pen to paper, in my opinion, to get things on the right track. So, so, so if you're a student company or a startup or pretty young, you know, you can't, and you guys have a process that you and it's really a solid process. What advice do you give to like startups in that regard who maybe don't have the resources to do that kind of thing? How can they do this better? Yeah, I think to me one of the very first things I would say to any startup team going out there is really deeply understand your user and understand what your purpose is because what you don't have as a startup is deep resources, just what you're saying. 
So you have to go out there and you have to get your team aligned. And the way to do that is to really know what problem you're solving and have a goal that everyone understands. Think about your user, then you can move into making the tech decisions. But when you work with an app and it just, you know, you guys have all had this experience where you find a new product, you download it, you try it, and it just delivers. They don't all do it, but some of them do. It's not easy to get there. You know, that's a very difficult process, and particularly to do it at scale. And that's why it costs so much. There are many steps along the way. That uh, is usually a product of restraint, yeah. you know, when something is delightful like that, when the design turns out so great. So that's for free, I guess, is that you can uh, narrow your focus and make sure you're just doing one or two things really well. And that, that keeps the cost down a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would like to comment on what you said. I think watching people use stuff is really the key to developing a new product. That, that was one of the concepts that we tried to teach in one of the courses that yeah. we are teaching in industrial technology. Uh, especially look for latent needs, things that are not obvious, and that are usually the, the things that generate great products or new products, innovation. Yeah, we talked a little bit today about um, how design research ties in with anthropology and the cultural differences with people that use or how people use things. Can you speak to that? Um, I know Marianne, you talked a little yeah, bit about so it, but Javier, I'm sure you're uh, familiar with this as well. Yeah, I mean, this is something that I'm a huge believer in. It's just what yeah, you're saying. Uh, yeah, ethnography, oh. contextual inquiry, um, there are a lot of different ways you can go about it, but like I'm a huge believer in user-focused design, and I think that in order to, you can't, you can't do that without paying close attention to your users, and if you have a big budget, you can work with specialists who do it, but there are a lot of techniques out there that you can learn through resources online that are simply ways to observe your customers, to find the latent needs, to see how they interact with your product and understand where the hurdles are, where the friction is, and where you can remove that friction and have them move through in a really natural and seamless way. And I think that's but are you describing actually the design of how the product works or just what the product even does? I think you can, you can work on both sides of it. I think when you're developing a concept and you're working on early prototyping, that to me is when you're doing a lot of the ethnography type mm -hmm. thing to understand what the need is and how it would fit into people's lives and the deeper understanding of that. To me, like the better job you can do developing the concept and making it fit. So I'm a believer in that, and then there are a lot of techniques you can do to refine how the product's actually working along the way. Well, isn't that the design thinking, I mean, that's the design thinking theory it right is. there. Yeah. You know, it's constantly being agile, it's being able to constantly make small adjustments as you're going through the process, and you're watching how people use your product. But that scares me when I hear design thinking, because I think that means I have to have, but be a designer. I have to have, know what's beautiful and what's not beautiful, and I have to know have an aesthetic that you know makes beautiful things. Design design thinking has doesn't necessarily have to do with the actual look and feel. It does, but it's it's more about if we're talking about a three D object, yeah. you know, that could be it might be made out of tin foil right now, but that's just the start of how does this thing function? How does it sh you know if it's sculpted? How do we change this? It's being able to use design thinking to make small adjustments throughout the course of a project to adapt. You know, there could be the smallest change. I mean, you guys work in packaging and that 3D and, you, you know, all the stuff that you do. You have to test and constantly make, be able to make little adjustments. If you, if you go all in right away without taking the time to do that, you're screwing yourself. Because if one thing isn't, isn't working for the audience or part of the audience or part of the people you need to attract, you, you've designed yourself out of that. You've designed yourself out of that, that sector. When we were just talking earlier about very early on defining functionality and the fact that sometimes you may make the decision to take some of the aesthetic out of the product, to take like the final colors to take those things out. I think you were just talking about mm -hmm. that. So you can really understand how the functionality is working and if you've got an issue with the functionality of the product that the design might hide and you wouldn't find it later. I think that can be really valuable, so it's, it's definitely not all about the aesthetic. So, Missy, in this yeah. case, you would call this exercise tonight design thinking exercise. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what design thinking is. And to take what you just said, Mary, to like the basis level in, in what we do, 
is, let's say with brand design or a logo design, we're working on a logo, we make sure every logo works in a single color, at the, in black or just white. Because when you want to put it on this, it needs to be able to read and be clear and your message needs to be just as tight as when you put it on a billboard and when you put it on a bus or when you sky ride it, whatever. But do you know what I'm saying? Like it's, that's a really important part of take, making sure that the base is there, taking out some of those aesthetics, making it as simple as possible. We do all of our software prototypes in black and white only on purpose because the color is distracting from the beginning. As soon as there's a color that any review meetings will immediately go to the I color. The blue. Yeah. I so when do you go to the color then, Jeff? We have a, after the wireframe and the flows are completely defined and approved, then then we slowly introduce color, and, and then, and it's always a problem, it happened to me today. As a matter of fact, that, you know, as soon as there's some visuals applied, that the, the, the conversation's over about functionality, because that is so, that, that's when everybody comes up with woodwork that's never said anything before, because they have an opinion about it. Is that hard, is that, I'm sorry, but I want to ask, is that hard for designers, uh, the, 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 the actual graphic and aesthetic designers to hold off on that? How do you? You're not in our process. I bet this process is similar. It's just a different it's, phase in the process. Yeah. They're not even part of the product in the beginning. And we explain, yeah. for us, clients can be involved in the very beginning of the process, but we explain to them before we even start our process, we, we really go through exactly what they're going to see from phase one all the way to final delivery so that they really do get an understanding of, of what they can expect. Do you ever have to go backwards? What, what do you, with yeah. a, when a project, let's say a product comes to you and uh, it's midway, can, do you have to start from scratch? Or? Sometimes. Yeah, it's a very iterative mm -hmm. process. Yeah, and so how it's, 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 it's a loop. So mm -hmm. You always go in a little bit backwards. Yeah. I've never been one where the entire core functionality was thrown out. Like, I've never been in that situation, but I've been in multiple situations where either due to like an internal situation on the client side or the fact that like the original design became sort of one part of it became sort of overwhelming in the UI and so you had to go back and sort of balance it again and move forward. I've seen those situations happen. Mm -hmm. And how about, how important is design vocabulary? We were, we want to skip that question. What does that even, <laughs> what is that like, well, it, I, and I feel like maybe, if, if like out of the box? Depending upon the environment you're working with. Are you working with an agency? Are you working with a studio? Um, are you working in a team where someone is using a different vocabulary um, um, across the table? I think, I think we have had some conversations about working with multifunctional teams and I think as you move forward in the design thinking approach, you end up with teams with a lot of different specialists on them. Ideally, they're all working towards the same goal and representing their specialty, but they're working together. And in those instances, you can have people who are working on essentially the same thing, but using very different vocabulary. And like marketing and graphic design and product development, each of those have some specialties and each of those have a vocabulary that's sort of a norm. And so in that instance, I think it's really important that you cross those barriers and you get the team aligned. And um, making sure that that the team has common goals and they're working with each other. I think that's important. I've seen it a bigger deal at larger companies than with startups because startup teams are inherently very small and already already working together. So. We, were, we, we met last night, we were looking at a, a new and notable app that is obviously the result of a failure of that. Yeah. It's the um, new Disney Movies app. Mm -hmm. uh, but released with some fanfare last week. Just, you know, look back to your iPhone here and take a look at it. It's the, the icon. Looks like it's done by committee. I mean, you can just tell everything about it smacks of uh, lots of input from too many people <laughs> that uh, were, there was no central authority, no central yeah. design authority. You know, the icon like, obviously had some, like, someone had, well, I have a logo here, and we got yeah. this thing, and Checked it's, all the boxes. it's terrible right. out of date, and then you delve into the app itself, and it's a self inconsistent mess, and, and something that's so simple, too. Like, that's what was extra frustrating. And from a company with, legendary design skills mm -hmm. that obviously due to, uh, to turn a phrase, human factors, you know, it went wrong. Um, I have some uh, tweeting questions for you. <laughs> so how much should a, should a startup business budget for logo and brand identity when money is very tight and they're just trying to get a launch? 
Uh, why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> it is a really good question. Um, it so much depends on the product, and it depends on who your target audience is. And it, there's so much that needs to happen. Um, I can tell you that I think startups need, I can tell you startups need to put aside more than they do, I, just from yeah. having worked with startups. It's a good investment. You have it to think it's a good investment. Yeah. You have a bad level. That's the thing, is, is it, it is, I can't put a dollar amount on that investment well, in your could company. You, could you sort of contrast which startups probably need to spend more on that versus what, in other words, what should you know about your startup that says, wow, I better really pay a lot of attention well, to this I, right now? One example, um, I met with a lot of teams here um, at the Hot House and at Cal Poly today, which was a wonderful experience and um, a joy to talk with everybody. But, you know, I met with a team that's working in the music space. It's a super competitive space. It's a very pop culture oriented space. It's sort of celebrity driven. That's a team that needs to be thinking and investing about their brand, not simply for their launch, but also for the fact that if they're going and they're participating in startup competitions, they're in pitch sessions, they need to stand out and they need to know there will be a lot of other music startups in that same space. So they need to have their offering and their business model and those things dialed in, they need to know that. But there's an emotion tied with music as well, and they need to know where they're going to live in that space and how they're going to build that out, because that's going to be what's going to make them stand out from all the other music startups in the space. Anything on the other side of that? Where would they, I mean, obviously it's a matter of degrees, right? Yeah. And, and how that happens. Um, well, you can spend a ton on your brand, and if you don't have a good product and you don't have a valid business model, that's not necessarily money well spent. Right. And you do and get the foundation in place. Well, and even if you have, haven't done the research to know who your brand is supposed to be speaking to, yeah. you can build a beautiful brand and falls flat because it doesn't reach that target audience. It's not going to yeah. the right people. But if you're a startup, you don't have to spend anything on doing that research. You should be doing that anyway, right? Out there yes. talking to all the people Absolutely. that you think are your potential customers and yeah. getting an understanding. And that should be one of the things that I think you should be doing as a startup is documenting all of that and doing a lot of it. And that's your time, that's your investment in your business. And realizing that the marketing and branding part of your business is, like you said, it's an investment. And it's, you know, you have to really think about what are you willing to invest in something? Is this thing a hobby or is this going to be a business? But is that market research or is that design research or both? I would say they go hand in hand. Yeah. yeah. How many people spend time and money on design research? Um, obviously, the big companies do, but how many businesses have that as a line item in their budget? I don't know if they consider it design research. I've never seen design research as part of. It. I think it's all part of marketing research. Mm -hmm. Would be my. They lump them all together. I, as, yeah, it's just always been part yeah, of it. Yeah, I think that's budget, part of the, yeah. the confusion of what we do. I mean, I think a lot of the design research as part of budgeting actually gets buried in the design line it's item because it's the agencies or it's the designers that are doing it. Yeah, exactly. The ethnographers, if it's a big project, mm -hmm. they're working on that side. Mm -hmm. um, at Microsoft, the there was just call it, the startup would just call it customer development Start, basically and lump yeah. everything in it because you're trying to find out a lot in. At the same time, basically. Yeah. yeah, I would say every startup that I've worked with that has someone on the team that's familiar with design research and very comfortable with those processes, they they come out of, they can basically get more out of a more limited budget. Like where you've got a team that's really like pure engineering coming from the technical side. They can have a wonderful product, but that connection to the user is sometimes missing. Mm -hmm. And so if you have somebody on your team who is very familiar and comfortable with how to talk to customers, what types of exercises you can do to elicit some of the latent mm -hmm. needs, and to optimize some user scenarios so you can figure out what is that one thing that you're going to do really beautifully, um, that's a team member that's worthwhile to have. Mm -hmm. Or find a friend who's good at it and take them out. Or take them out. Take a yeah. bunch of beer or something. <laughs> Well, I, I have, have to investigate. I have another question it. here. But oh. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, I have to investigate an existing product, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I try to find the tech support people. They're the ones that really know, you know, that have been on the phone with screaming customers or crying customers, and they're the yeah. ones that know where the mm -hmm. weak spots are and the trouble spots. So that's that's the go-to. Now, for a startup, but you know, you don't have existing tech support. But maybe if you're doing something in a certain genre, you know, you find another company that's doing that and talk to their tech support people if you can. They really know it because they're 
that's where the boots are on the ground. Yeah, I'd say on the marketing side, if you go talk to the sales force, the people at Mount Deal, it would be the equivalent of that mm -hmm. on the design side. Yeah, less theoretical. Mm -hmm. So what are the top two apps or tools that you use that we might not know about? <laughs> well, I, lately, I have been using Adobe Ideas to sketch. Adobe Ideas, is yeah. that part of the cloud? Yeah, you can use it with the cloud or just with Dropbox. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I was just talking with someone about this earlier. It's certainly not new. It's been around for a while, but I travel a lot, and um, I really rely on TripIt constantly. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of TripIt, so if you travel a lot and you haven't played with it, you haven't tried it, you should go get it. <laughs> as far as a tool, uh, strangely, we and so many other firms are starting using Keynote for all our wireframe designs. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's bizarre, but it's a decent, it's a decent drawing tool. And yeah. yeah. And because it has pages, you can make pages linked to each other. And because there's an inexpensive sort of clip art kit called Keynotopia that has all the UI parts. So we moved away from balsamic or raw drawing tools for any sort of uh, and, and it's free, you get it on your Mac. So that's as far as an app I really admire that you may not use. Uh, like Hotel Tonight is a is a great I love app. That. Yeah, not a great app. Um, it is. I it's, like the it's, signing it's, process. It's so, so clever. clever. Uh, it's, their logo looks like a it's like an H spread up but it's like, like a bed. Bed. And so Hotel, hotel tonight. tonight. So you're committed as you commit to buying a hotel room for the night. You have to trace your finger on that. It's shape. really good for people that <laughs> travel and all of a sudden yeah. they're like, oh man, I'm not going to be able to get home tonight or whatever. I need to find a hotel. They get, show you all the great deals. So you become a member, and then you can log in and you sign. It's just really very intuitive. Yeah. Very cool. The reason I admire it is it's so single purpose. It's yeah. not you can't book a hotel for tomorrow. You can't, you know, <laughs> go to cities they don't cover. It's for I need a hotel near me right now. Right now. And smart. Uh, <laughs> and it's we talked we've touched this a little bit about emotion or the connection between a user. You know, it has sort of a, a, a swank, sophisticated look and appearance that makes you feel cool. And uh, they even rate the hotels like hip, cool, standard. Yeah, this is a hip hotel, yeah. standard hotel. <laughs> you know, it's very smart. Um, and they really stuck to doing that one thing super well. Um, and you, you usually get a cheaper room, too. So it's not just style and substance. Yeah. Um, we, at my studio, and me, I live off of something called Function Point, which basically helps us track and manage every bit of every project. Um, super boring, I know, but managing your time, and we went through a million different types of time trackers and project trackers. Function Point has everything we need. It allows us to just really, I mean, from everything from buying a stock photo, if we end up buying one, to putting in a font purchase. It's just amazing, and we need that because Designers, if any of you are designers, you guys know that you can easily lose tons of time doing really dumb little things. And, and lose tons of money. Exactly. Money. And then my other favorite one is one called Urban Daddy. It doesn't work in slow, but if you go to a big city, it is hilarious. I like it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's basically a find something to do app um, with spinners. And it's who do you want, who, where are you, uh, who are you with, and what are you up for? And it just shows you what's happening. Great in, a, in an urban area. Hey, Lorraine, what about you? As far as apps, yeah. I'm an Evernote, but that's not new. But <laughs> it's my life. I you have tied to my Evernote. So yeah, there was actually one see. for the designers in the room that I just started playing with. If you're curious, you might want to check out too. Have you guys seen? Um, oh shit! Yeah. Yeah. Have you played with Flatten? Uh -huh. Um, it's a, basically Instagram for designers where people are posting tattoo art, graphic design, mm -hmm. and illustrations, and Fleck, 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 F L E C K, Fleck. And I will double check that before the night is over okay. to make sure that I got the name right. But it is a, it's Fleck, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. This next question is sort of related to the last one. What are your favorite books on design? Uh, no. <laughs> no. No, I have one, but I. I'm notoriously bad at remembering. <laughs> there's, there's, you know, um, I go to a conference every year and there's always authors there and there was one book that I picked up a year or two ago, so it's not new, but it's really about the creative process and um, it, it's good for teams and I'm not going to remember the name of it and I'm sorry, but it, it basically was exercises you could do as teams 
um, similar to kind of what you guys did today. Um, I will have to get back to you. If you find it, we'll, will we'll, it we'll tweet you. it. We will put yeah. it on our Facebook page. We will but it was skywrite it. it, was it was great, skywrite it. Creative thinking is, is what it's about, and it was just really great exercises. Yeah, there's a, um, a, there's a book that came out recently by one of my partners and one of our mentors called Rise of the DEO that is about mm. creative leadership, and it's, um, it's a really cool book to check out, so you might want to check that one out. So it's really what it's about a design executive officer. It's basically kind of the evolution of senior leaders and companies and how the design thinking approach is being integrated. So that's one that you, it's a pretty great book. You might want to spend some time with that one. Uh, a book I like is called The Design of Everyday Things by Doug Norman. Mm -hmm. I think it's really nice. We, mm -hmm. It relates psychology, how, how we perceive, perceive objects and how we use them. Okay, and then what project are you most proud of and why? I wrote an app with my work colleague last year, just the two of us, uh, because we, could, we do kind of, you know, we, we design apps for other people all the time, but we want to do one for ourselves. And he had a specific idea in mind, and it's called Blossom Dress Up. It's for iPad, and pretty soon for iPhone as soon as I get around it. And uh, for us, it was just a pure, you know, sort of itch we had to scratch, artistic expression, and we wanted to do. Uh, it's a little girl's dress up app. You know, it's for girls like he's got a daughter who's uh, first grade. Uh, it has no words in it. It's a completely gesture interface because it's for pre-readers, so that was a fun challenge. And, uh, um, and I'm proud of it. I think it turned out good. It, it's, a, it's darling. If you have any little nieces or cousins, <laughs> it's like, it's so great. The shadow project I did for my master thesis, it was consisted of, consisted of designing child resistant uh, packaging for uh, older adults and people with disabilities. But we, gratifying to do user research with, with the demographic of not the typical uh, user for this I, I think for me, this is hard, because I, um, I think for me the best project I've ever done or had an opportunity to do was actually starting my own firm. And I know that might sound like a cop out, but 10 years ago I came up here, didn't know anybody, and came from a big city and decided to do something different. And um, I saw there was a need and I tried to fill it. So that for me is, you know, every project that comes in and out of our doors, I'm proud of, you know, um, and it's, it's, I couldn't pinpoint one project. I mean, it's been great, you know, we have some really great clients and we work with beer, how could that be bad? We work with brownies, that can't be bad either. You know what I mean? And so it's just, we've been really lucky to, to have some great clients, but I think that for me has been my biggest success and joy. So we were gonna open it up to the yeah, audience. Any questions so from the audience here? We have a few doesn't. more minutes. Chelsea, you have a question? From a non-designer perspective, if I wanted to Learning about design as an entrepreneurship student, how would I do that? Like, what would be my first steps for, for that? There are a lot. Of, do you want to? So, graphic design. Graphic. So, there are a lot of resources, um, so particularly how to learn about graphic design. Um, there are a lot of resources available online that you can work through on your own time. It's sort of amazing what's out there. You look for it. And so if it's something that you're trying to do kind of in your spare time or as an aside, I would probably start there if you're looking for specific graphic design skills. I don't do graphic design for interaction design. Um, <coughs> books are a little dated and stuff. Uh, I would read interaction design start with the design guidelines from Apple and Google for the two platforms fascinated to read them and compare what they emphasize um, and value Linda has some Linda, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty pretty current. there's some definite online um, stuff but I would also start talking to people that do it 
you know, to go I think you can substitute for having someone look at what you, you're doing yeah. and comment. Yeah, and yeah. Well, that's what you yeah. miss with the online class. Like, you can get a foundation and some of the language and that kind of thing, but getting somebody to critique your work if it's something that, you know, you really that's want to build out is important. Well, that was sort of why I asked was, from an entrepreneurship student perspective, how important is it for me to understand what my designer is doing? Like, so how much does the business person in the business need to understand what the designer is doing? Right. I'm just signing a check. Yeah, just pay right. them. You know, uh, I mean, you know what's good. You know, I think when you see the results, you know what's good. It's if it works well and is appealing. You know, the road to get there is what takes so much experience. But um, you know, if you see what you consider reasonable progress along the way, and uh, that you know, each step it gets better, and when it's nearing the end, it, it feels right. You know, you can do that without having a big vocabulary about what's going on. Yeah, and I, I don't think you need to necessarily know how to use Adobe to understand. You know, if you're depending on what role you have in the startup, but to know if your brand is connecting or not, like you're going to get feedback on that, whether it's overt or it's simply that you're not growing your users at the speed that you want. You know. So there are other ways to do it. So I would wor worry more about. We have another question in the back there. Yeah. I made an attempt to teach human-centered design as part of design thinking to my main teaching engineering students. And as we all know, one of the first steps uh, is to use your empathy as you design, as you define your problem. And several of my students had questions about that step. Uh, maybe it's because we are designing machines in the future, but do you have any examples from your experiences where you used your empathy and then you ended up with a different design compared to what you have? Well, um, I gave a little design talk at the hackathon, and my first slide was just the word empathy, because <laughs> I think that's the core skill in design, mm -hmm. is empathy, being able to step outside yourself and see something with a fresh set of eyes, a non-judgmental set of eyes, and you're removing all your preconceived uh, ideas if you can. That's really hard to do as humans. And I'm kind of not surprised that engineering students weren't great at empathy. It's just not their build, you know? Yeah. <laughs> or your design students, so. Uh, and think about how many times you've heard the word emotion tonight. You know, empathy is the you know, ability to sense emotion in another person or, you know, and to, um, understand that. So that is the softest kind of skill, and, and, yeah. and it is hard to teach. And it's where I think it is the biggest tripping point in design is to not be empathetic to think this is obvious, or people will certainly understand this, and then not believing the evidence when tests show otherwise. You know, I was working with a telehealth. Was it, this is an example of exactly that. I was working with somebody. It was a startup, which uh, they had some funding, and they were in the telehealth space. They were basically working with a very specialized app that you could talk to a doctor remotely, and they were looking at different models of um, essentially like monitors that you could set up in an ER or medical setting that would kind of get the doctor where they could see the patient, and you could have a discussion through this app. And the engineers and the folks working on it were all very brilliant, and they actually, you know, they had their platform, like the first generation was pretty good, but we took it into a setting that was the actual, a rep replica of an actual ER in Palo Alto. And when you go through that, what was missing was the external piece of it was frightening and sort of off-putting, you know, it's very robotic looking. And so even though the interface like, was functionally very good, they needed to humanize the, ex the exterior of it so that people would feel comfortable and trusting and the particular kids wouldn't be scared. So I think that's an example of the change. Question up here. Yeah. How does someone go about learning to be more empathetic towards the customer? Okay. Let me, I'll repeat the question if you didn't hear it in the back. How does, that's a great question. How does someone go about learning to be more empathetic to the customer or the user or the, the person in the community out there? I think it takes time. I mean, it takes experience and time. You have to you have to be aware of um, the fact that you're walking into someone else. For me, I'm walking into someone else's world every time we start a project, and I really have to to step back and 
hear them out and listen to mm -hmm. them and think about everything they're saying and everything that they believe. This is their, their baby on a lot of levels, you know? Um, when it's time for me to, to put my own piece out there and do whatever I'm gonna do, that's when I can take empathy and throw it out so it's about me. But, you know, I have to really think about the fact that it took, you know, it took some time to, to really develop that and really think about who the, who's this, who this belongs to, but then who are the users? Who are the people that this needs to talk to, which is a good example of what you just brought up. You know, you made this beautiful thing, but like a kid saw it and started crying, that sucks. You know, it's not good for the kids. It gets beaten into you by your failures and Absolutely. by saying yeah. things that you thought Speaking. were right. The, the, Missy said right. something, I want to uh, repeat it though, since you're walking or going into the world of, your, of the other person. So some things, those of you who are entrepreneurship students at Cal Poly know, we call that getting out of the building, talking to people. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you have you use you use her you know, the, the expert so you have to listen to him or her and don't make any assumptions just listen yeah. don't make assumptions. I think part of that too it goes goes perfectly along with not making assumptions is the better you understand your own biases the better you can be self reflective and know what bias you're bringing into the room it helps mm -hmm. you sort of speed that up a little bit to make that connection and sort of get further into the head of the user. Mm -hmm. I have another Twitter question. So what skills, either design or otherwise, do you think recent grads need to have to be successful in their new jobs? And then Empathy. Wrap it up. Really skills. skills. <laughs> Empathy. That's it. Skills. <laughs> is empathy a skill? It, in our business, I think it is. Yeah. yeah. I think being super observant, too, of, of details. Uh, again, I mean, that's a really soft. <laughs> Be empathetic and observant. Those are, those but are I think skills. observant is true because you know when you're going out into the real world or you're starting a business, there's so much you have to really think about, um, and you have. But not just that, you have to really be watching. You have to be paying attention. Um, you have to be willing to just continue to learn. That's probably the biggest thing I would say is you have to realize that yeah, you just graduated and you're awesome, but that old chick in the office in the corner can school you in seconds with not, maybe maybe she doesn't know, and I'm totally talking about myself, <laughs> but maybe she doesn't know how to program a thing or do this, but when it comes to the, the actual getting it done, the actual um, learning how to communicate, the actual how to communicate with others, how to get messages out there, um, just how to be a business owner, that's, those are the kinds of things that take time. It doesn't happen fast. Yeah, and how to find partnerships too, like how to identify the people that are going, you, that you can learn something important from or that can help if it's a business, if you're working on a startup, how to find the right mentors and partners who can really genuinely help you move forward either personally or your business. That's a skill that takes some practice. Some people start off kind of inherently better at that than others, but you work on it, I think that's really critical to who succeeds in the long run. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think of this, this panel here? These people are awesome. <laughs> Lorraine for helping put together the program and helping us work on it today. Go to CIE Calpoly CIE .calpoly .edu and get on our mailing list so we can see you at the next forum in April. And thank you everyone for being here and thank you to our panel again. This was a really fun evening. One, one last note, if you don't mind dropping off your name badges on your way out, we recycle those every uh, forum. So just drop them off on your way out, and if you want to take your construction beautiful project home, please do. <laughs> Thank you for coming.